Successful incubation and hatching of ratite eggs and chicks is one of the most challenging, frustrating, and rewarding aspects of ratite management. Countless hours of research has been conducted by breeders and veterinarians throughout the United States, Australia, and Africa on incubation and hatching. This tape will incorporate the experiences that we have had in raising ratites with information from veterinarians and researchers. Several of the techniques that we will be presenting have consistently worked for us, saving our ranch thousands of dollars throughout the past year's breeding seasons. We will explore the developmental stages of ostrich, emu, and rhea. Incubation techniques vary slightly with each of the ratites, but the developmental procedure of the embryo and the hatching procedures are the same. The mating dance is the beginning of the reproductive cycle. As each breeding season approaches, males and females begin to posture and preen. Choosing their mate for the next breeding season and establishing their territory. Soon the breeding begins on a daily basis throughout the ranch. This marks the time period in which the breeder begins to monitor the pens for eggs. Then one day, the treasured eggs begin to appear. The nesting instincts in all of the ratites is so very strong at the beginning of the breeding season that the rancher is many times caught unaware. They may find that the birds have been hiding these eggs for some time. In the wild, this is nature's way of storing the eggs until the birds are ready to begin the incubation process. The discovery of the eggs signals the beginning of the incubation phase in a ratite rancher's life. Artificial incubation of eggs has been practiced for thousands of years. Several records tell of Greeks using rotting manure to incubate chicken eggs. The Chinese perfected this art by adding chopped straw and rice hulls to the manure. Philippine Islanders would pay their servants to incubate eggs by placing the eggs between sticks over a bed of ashes and covering the eggs with blankets and their bodies. More than a century ago, South African farmers used native girls to hatch ostrich eggs with their body heat. Today, we incubate artificially in modern incubators, but principles remain the same. Once the nest of eggs has been discovered, the modern rancher must carefully gather the eggs and begin the artificial incubation process. Before we discuss egg incubation, it is important to understand the structure of the egg itself. The shell of the egg should be viewed as the developing embryo's respiratory system. Consequently, a healthy respiratory system is vital to the embryo development. If the pores are clogged, the embryo cannot receive sufficient oxygen and the embryo suffocates. This can occur at any stage in the incubation process. Many eggs termed infertile may be embryos that have not yet developed due to suffocation during the first hours and days of incubation. The pore structure of the eggshell differs with each of the ratites. The rhea is the simplest, with the pores branching as they extend from the interior to the exterior of the egg. The ostrich pore is much more complex as it branches toward the exterior of the egg and has a fewer number of surface pores that are very visible to the eye. The emu shell is split into different levels with pores opening into a maze of air channels within the egg shell. The air channels only vent to the outside in a few places. A conclusion can be drawn that if a portion of the emu pores are clogged, the embryo can obtain oxygen through the air channel maze from a pore that is not obstructed. There are many more pores at the blunt end of the egg where the air cell is than anywhere else on the shell. This allows the greatest transfer of oxygen and waste gases. Bacteria also has access to the embryo through this same pore structure. The different layers of shell in the emu egg may create an additional defense against bacteria gaining direct access to the interior of the egg. Conversely, the direct access in the ostrich and rhea eggs may be an explanation as to why ostrich and rhea are more susceptible to bacterial complications and tend to readily absorb bacteria if left in the rain. There is a granular inner layer of the shell where calcium that is needed to create the skeletal structure of the embryo is stored. This spongy calcium carbonate 
is absorbed through the incubation process, leaving the shell brittle at the time of hatch. At Day's Exotics, we only brush off the residual mud or dirt from our eggs. Around each egg, there is a cuticle that coats the egg as it passes from the hen in the final stages of formation. This is a natural defense mechanism that protects the developing embryo from bacteria. This cuticle, or mucin, remains hard during the first seven to ten days. Then the cuticle cracks during the incubation process, allowing a greater transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide through the shell. By washing the egg in a disinfectant solution, the cuticle, which feels slimy when wet, is damaged or removed from the egg. We believe that nature's own system of defense, the cuticle, is best left intact. In the event that the egg is covered with mud, there are several ways to remove the mud so that the embryo can breathe freely through the pores in the shell. A simple wiping of the egg with a paper towel will remove most of the dirt. This does not damage the cuticle. By using a damp paper towel dipped in water 10 degrees hotter than the egg, caked on mud can be wiped from the surface. If a more thorough cleaning is needed, the egg can be dipped in a Tektrol solution and lightly scrubbed to remove any debris. The egg is then carefully dried with another paper towel. Again, by washing the egg, the cuticle has been removed from the egg and the embryo stands a greater chance of bacterial exposure. Because your egg is porous when placed in a warmer liquid, it will push out any bacteria in the pores of the eggshell, which will then be killed by the sterilizing agent. If the liquid is colder than the egg when dipped, the egg will suck in any bacteria present and the bacteria does not become exposed to the killing disinfectant. Be sure to rotate the egg in the liquid so as to cover the area originally touched by your hands. The next question to be answered is one of egg storage. In the poultry industry, it is standard to store eggs for a period of time before incubation. In the wild, the eggs are essentially in storage until the adult sits the nest and the incubation cycle begins. By storing the eggs until several have been gathered and incubating them together, several will hatch at the same time. This will cut down on the amount of time spent in the process of hatching. Egg storage may increase the embryo's ability to absorb oxygen more readily. When an egg is first laid, the albumen, or egg white, that surrounds the yolk of the egg is of a high quality and is very dense. The fresh albumen may present a significant barrier to oxygen and carbon dioxide gas exchange during the initial stages of incubation. By storing the eggs for a period of time, the albumen, or egg white, begins to degrade or thin. This thinning process allows a greater oxygen exchange. There is some evidence to suggest that the setting of fresh eggs is associated with reduced hatchability and poor chick quality, since the fresh oxygen exchange must occur across a double barrier of both the eggshell and the albumen. At Day's Exotics, we store our eggs three to four days at the beginning of a laying cycle, decreasing to two days towards the end of the season. The albumen is of a higher, denser quality at the beginning of the laying season versus the end of a laying season. Eggs can be stored for up to seven days without significant amount of reduced mortality. Between seven and 14 days, the mortality increases dramatically. The optimum storage temperature is 59.5 degrees. This can be achieved by placing the eggs in an ice chest after the eggs have reached room temperature. The ice chest should have a cooling source, such as an ice pack or a bottle full of frozen water. Changing the cooling source on a daily basis is required to maintain the correct temperature. Placing the cold source in a container away from the eggs assures that the water condensation will not occur as the cold source warms, causing moisture to come into contact with the eggs as melting occurs. Turning the eggs while in storage is very important. If the eggs are not turned, the yolk will slowly float to the top of the egg and the developing embryo will stick to the outer membrane, resulting in mortality. By using a turning tray in the storage unit, the eggs can be turned in the opposite direction daily. The yolk is held in place within the shell by two rubber band-like strings of tissue called the calaisi. 
These spring-like coils are wound in opposite directions and serve as the support to the yolk. If the eggs are turned in the same direction daily, one of the calaisi will wind up while the other one unwinds too far, creating undue stress and causing the death of the embryo. The embryo only uses the nutrients contained within the egg white or albumin that are actually in contact with it. By turning the egg, the embryo has a fresh supply of nutrients during storage and especially during incubation. Every egg should be weighed before and during incubation. As eggs are being incubated, water is lost through the pores in the egg along with carbon dioxide. By weighing the eggs when they are collected, when they are first placed in the incubator and every seven to 10 days throughout the incubation cycle, it can be determined if the humidity in the incubator is set correctly. Most ratite eggs should lose between 13 and 15 percent of their weight between the time they are laid and hatching. If they lose less than 13 to 15 percent, the humidity is too high in the incubator. If they lose more than 13 to 15 percent, the humidity is too low. Since ostrich, emu, and rhea require different humidity settings, Weighing the eggs will help in the determination of the correct humidity setting for each egg. Initially, incubator humidity can be set at 26% relative humidity for ostrich, 42% for emu, and 48% for rhea. Adjustments will need to be made once weight loss has been determined. Incubators may contain hot and cool spots. By determining at the beginning of the season where these spots are, the breeder can incubate their eggs correctly. Embryos require more heat during the initial stages of development than at the end. Near the hatch, the maturing embryo generates heat itself. The average gestation period for chicks is ostrich at 42 days, emu at 52 days, and rhea at 38 days. Gestation period may vary according to the temperature in the incubator. The higher the temperature, the shorter the gestation period. Temperature is extremely important. The embryo stored at 59.9 degrees does not experience any cell activity and the embryo is suspended in development. At 70 degrees, embryonic development is not possible, but some cells will show activity and several days of prolonged exposure will prevent the embryo from developing normally when incubation has begun. During incubation below 95 degrees, there is development, but abnormalities in the chick will often occur. Above 102.2 degrees, the embryonic development is restricted and the embryo dies within hours if it's early in the development or within minutes if it is near hatch. Between 96.8 and 97.5, Chick development seems to be best for ratites. We normally incubate at 97 degrees with successful results. We move our eggs from the incubator to the hatcher after the chick has pipped through the membrane surrounding the chick into the air cell. The interior of the egg is constructed with the developing chick in the center of the egg. A membrane surrounds the developing embryo and a second membrane is closest to the shell. At the blunt end of the egg is an air cell which contains approximately a 24-hour supply of oxygen for the chick to breathe once it is internally pipped and before breaking through the shell. There are several methods for determining when a bird has internally pipped. The emu cannot be candled because of the dark opaque shell. Upon tapping the eggs, a distinctive hollow sound can be heard in the egg that is preparing to hatch. Some breeders can hear the chick in the egg peeping once it is broken into the air cell. The first egg is in the middle stages of incubation. The second and third eggs sound hollow indicating that the chicks have internally pipped. An infertile egg will sound like porcelain or china.
In the ostrich and rhea, about two days before hatching, the air cell becomes elongated and seems to take over half of the egg, signaling an imminent hatch. Once the chick has internally pipped, the egg is moved to the hatcher. Both the ostrich and the rhea can be candled and the chick can be seen as it has entered the air cell. It is possible to determine the placement of the beak and the right foot which rhythmically pushes and breaks the shell open. As the chick is moved to the hatcher, it is important to check the temperature and humidity in the unit. This chick is correctly positioned. The discolored membrane marks the point of pipping through. The beak is correctly placed with the foot over the top of the head. The membrane is very dry with no bleeding. If the hatcher is more than half full, the temperature can be lowered as much as one degree to avoid heat stress to the hatching chicks, since they are emitting a great amount of heat as they are hatching. If there are only one or two eggs in the hatcher, the temperature can remain the same as the incubator. An increased humidity of one to two degrees wet bulb, or a 10 to 15 percent increase, can assist in the membrane around the chicks staying moist throughout the hatch. The humidity should only be increased if the egg has consistently lost the appropriate weight of 13 to 15 percent. If the egg is heavy, the humidity can be lowered slightly so as to allow the chick to lose additional weight during the hatch. Upon incubation, the ostrich and rhea eggs should be candled to determine the location of the air cell. It is important to note whether or not there is a torn inner membrane in the egg upon incubation. The torn membrane shows in candling as another ragged line just beyond the air cell. This torn membrane may allow bacteria easier entry into the shell. These eggs should be incubated separately. Candling can indicate fertility at approximately seven to 10 days. Infertile eggs will remain unclouded. If it is fertile, the egg will begin to show a darkening mass. It is possible during the first 15 days to see the ostrich and rhea embryo and the veining inside the egg. With emu eggs, it is impossible to candle the eggs. Approximately 30 days into the incubation cycle, fertility can be determined by touching the eggs. After a tray of eggs has been allowed to cool down for not more than five minutes, the eggs can be felt to determine if there is an active embryonic heat source. Eggs, cool to the touch, probably are infertile and should be moved to an incubator with the same temperature and humidity setting for further observation. At 35 to 40 days, a distinctive rocking or movement of the egg can be seen. This is the chick moving and repositioning itself within the shell. This becomes more vigorous closer to the hatch. As breeders, we are most anxious not to lose any chicks in the shell. The poultry industry experiences a 7 to 10 percent natural death of embryos within the shell during incubation. A portion of the deaths occur within the first three to four days due to malformation of the embryo. Another portion of the deaths occur two to three days prior to hatch as the respiratory system in the developing embryo changes and the chick needs more oxygen. Rough handling during incubation can also cause a developing chick to become weak and not hatch. First trimester embryonic deaths are often the result of excessive jarring of the eggs, improper egg storage, incorrect temperature settings, suffocation due to incorrect ventilation or thick albumin, poor nutrition in the parents, or bacterial invasion. Second trimester deaths can be the result of parental nutrition, inadequate egg turning, inadequate ventilation, temperature and humidity settings, bacterial invasion. Third trimester deaths are due to malpositions, poor temperature and humidity control, inadequate ventilation, bacterial invasions. 
The presence of bacteria can be seen in the presence of green fluid within the yolk sac. This chick died in the last stages of incubation. The inner membrane is not completely white. Here we are looking into the shell through the air cell. As the chick approaches hatch, it fills the air cell almost completely. The chick on the right is a third trimester fatality. The one on the left is presently hatching. The common factors in embryonic deaths are incorrect temperature and humidity, presence of bacteria, and poor ventilation. By addressing each of these areas daily, the incidence of embryonic deaths can be greatly reduced, directly affecting the profitability of the breeding season. Proper ventilation is a key factor in incubation. Embryos may appear to be normal, but have in fact suffocated due to lack of oxygen. This may occur due to an incubator being full of like-age embryos, each requiring more oxygen than is available in the unit. We open our incubators at least three times a day to replenish the fresh air in the unit. Improper room ventilation may contribute to suffocation. Without a constant source of fresh air, the embryos are forced to use air that is heavily contaminated with waste gases from other eggs. Embryos require the most oxygen at 20 to 29 days for ostrich, 26 to 36 days for emu, and 18 to 25 days for rhea. Another peak time for oxygen consumption is two days prior to hatch. Consequently, many of the dead in-shell chicks just prior to hatch may have suffocated. At hatch, the carbon dioxide level in the chick is at its highest, forcing the chick to seek oxygen by breaking through the inner membrane into the air cell. Upon entering the air cell, the chick must replenish the oxygen supply in the blood and gain strength to break open the shell. This accounts for a two to four day delay between internal pipping and the actual hatching of the chick. A correctly positioned chick should be located within the small end of the egg. The air cell is at the blunt end. The neck of the bird is curled from the body on the right side as you are facing the egg to the left side. The beak of the bird will be located on top of the curved neck facing the blunt end of the egg and the right foot of the bird will be over the head of the chick pushing against the eggshell and breaking it open at hatch. It is very important not to disturb the shell at the top of the egg toward the back. This is the location of the yolk sac in the final stages of absorption as the chick hatches. The chick must struggle out of the shell to absorb the yolk sac completely. Exposure of the yolk sac before absorption can lead to bacterial infection as the sac is drawn into the abdominal cavity. The chick must break open the shell before it uses up the 24-hour air supply in the air cell. If the chick appears weak from exhaustion or the 24 hours are up, it may be necessary to break open the shell to give the chick a fresh air source. The air cell is obvious in the ostrich and rhea once the egg is candled. Since the emu egg cannot be candled, it is necessary to determine which end of the egg contains the air cell. By rolling the egg, it will center with the body of the chick to the bottom and the head to the top. The lighter blunt end of the egg contains the air cell. To break open the egg, locate the air cell, move one inch up towards the top of the egg, and one inch to the left side as you are facing the air cell. This is the location of the chick's beak. Gently tap the egg with a pointed hammer and put a hole in the shell for the chick to breathe through. Do not break back any more shell than is necessary to give the chick air. The inner membrane can bleed if torn too early and will result in a chick that bleeds to death.
If the egg has been broken into before internal pipping has occurred, the hole in the shell must be covered to control moisture loss. Saran wrap can be placed over the hole to hold in the moisture and simulate the strength of the shell. If the beak is not located where the hole has been placed in the egg, carefully peel back the shell and look for a brownish discoloration of the inner white membrane. A break in the membrane should coincide with the location of the discoloration, and this is where the beak should be. Sometimes the chick will become malpositioned in the shell by turning their head backwards. A twisted neck is the indicator. This is the correct positioning. Malpositioned chicks can occur due to the incubation humidity being too low or too high. The careful weighing of eggs will assist in humidity control. Many times the chick can break out of the shell even though it is not positioned correctly. Other times the chick may weaken and die and it becomes necessary to hunt for the beak of the bird. Usually the chick will be positioned correctly but at the opposite end on the bottom of the egg. Many times the chick may have rotated within the shell and the chick's back is presented to the shell opening. The head will be tucked to the underside of the shell. Without peeling back a portion of the shell, the chick may suffocate for lack of oxygen. The beak needs to be located and exposed to fresh air. The chick should then be left to struggle out of the egg on its own. Here is another example of a rotated emu chick. This chick's neck was protruding from the end of the shell and its head is underneath. The shell is peeled back to locate the beak. Wet chicks occur if the humidity is too high in the incubator. The chicks do not lose water as they are developing. These chicks may die by drowning or may appear to be edemic upon hatch. Fluid-filled tissue in the newly hatched chick is the indicator. By keeping accurate weight loss records, much of this problem can be corrected. If the chicks appear edematous at a rate of 13 to 15 percent weight loss, the humidity may still need to be adjusted downward to achieve a 16 to 18 percent weight loss. This seems to be necessary in larger emu eggs and ostrich eggs weighing in excess of 1900 grams. Adjustments in the temperature downward to near 96 degrees to increase the length of incubation may also be warranted. If egg storage does not occur, it is possible that water contained within the fresh egg which is normally lost during storage as a result of the thinning of the albumin must occur during incubation. If the egg is incubated with too high a humidity and some of the excess water has not been lost prior to incubation, the chick may be edematous or appear to have water-filled tissue at hatch. Normal navels will appear to be small openings in the chick's belly. These should be treated with 5% iodine at hatch and each day thereafter for two to three days. The yolk sac is the nutrition source for the developing embryo. The entire yolk sac must be absorbed into the chick through the navel. The yolk sac is quite large even in the last few days of development. Protruding yolk sacs most commonly occur when the chick has been assisted out of the shell by the breeder. It may take three to four days for a chick to completely hatch. It is necessary to let the chick hatch at its own rate once it has an available air supply. Too high humidity may also contribute to the protruding yolk sac. Then apply Corona to the sac. This is an antibacterial dressing that will cause the sac to absorb into the abdomen at a faster rate. By wrapping a chick in a tight diaper, the chick will struggle to get free in the hatcher. This simulates the shell and the yolk sac will continue to be absorbed.
Sticky chicks occur due to too low a humidity in the incubator and or hatcher. Cement-like dark yellow albumin encases the chick, making it almost impossible for the chick to hatch normally on its own. The chick on the left was a sticky chick. It has some residue on its head, giving it a slicker, matted appearance. The chick finds it difficult to rotate in the egg because it is drying out and becoming sticky. The chick must be able to rotate freely inside the egg in order to break the shell around the blunt end of the egg. This cement-like matter needs to be removed as quickly as possible to avoid drying. Because the membranes have become tough, the exhausted chick may not have enough strength to break out. Residual albumin is present in the shell after hatch in the form of yellowish globs of jelly-like fluid. This is due to a humidity that is too high or a temperature that is too low. If the egg weight is correct, eliminating humidity as the source of the problem, the temperature should be checked to make sure that it is consistently set at the required setting. Once the chick has hatched successfully, the shell debris must be immediately removed from the hatcher. Some of the shell may have been contaminated with bacteria prior to incubation, and the bacteria has been held away from the embryo by the shell during incubation. Once the chick hatches, the bacteria will come into contact with the new chick and will multiply rapidly in the warm, moist atmosphere of the hatcher. Regular cleaning of the hatcher unit will eliminate multiplying bacteria even after the shell debris has been removed. Chick down can be removed by a handheld vacuum cleaner on a daily or weekly basis. After hatch, many chicks have legs that spread apart to each side. We routinely hobble our chicks in the hatcher for the first 12 to 24 hours. This is done by placing tape around the lower leg of the chick, the width of the chick's shoulders. As the chick's bones and cartilage harden, the legs do not splay. Many times the legs splay after the chick has been moved to a brooder box. This especially occurs if the chick is placed on slick surfaces. By using a surface with a grip, the sliding can be cut down considerably. The legs can be hobbled by placing leg bands on the chick with a rubber band attached. This gives the chick unrestricted movement while keeping the legs in the correct position. The hobbles can remain for 24 to 48 hours, then be removed. Curled toes are a problem in chicks that have been incubated with too high humidity or who have taken an extremely long time in hatching from the shell. By taping the toe to a stick, the bone and cartilage in the toe will become firm within 24 hours and the tape can be removed. If the entire foot is turned, a finger splint can be applied to the leg, correcting the twisting within 24 hours. This is the corrected foot a day later. Birds without this correction will grow up with rolled toes and arthritic joints. Occasionally, this is a genetic defect. Usually, it is a result of improper incubation. Although this may not limit the adult bird's ability to move freely or breed, it does result in the aesthetic value of the bird becoming greatly reduced. In conclusion, we do not wash away the cuticle from the egg unless it is necessary. We store our eggs for two to four days before incubation. We have found at Days Exotics that the temperature in our incubators is best set at 97 degrees for all ratites. We strive to achieve a weight loss of 13 to 15 percent per egg and set our humidity according to the weight loss of the egg. We, we move our eggs into the hatcher once the chicks have internally pipped and we do not break into the shell to assist the chick out unless it is an emergency situation. We keep a constant fresh air supply in our incubator room so that the developing chick can breathe fresh, clean air through its shell on a daily basis. The happy, robust, healthy chick who hatches on its own is the norm. All the situations presented here are the exception to the rule in the raising of our birds. We need only to be prepared for the unusual situation and know how to remedy it without endangering the balance of our hatch, 
so that we may reap the fun and the profits that these birds bring. We look forward each day to playing with our birds and watching them as they play with each other. This is the end result that we all strive to achieve. Our mothering instincts are constantly tested by raising wild birds on our farms and ranches. We all look forward each year to lots of healthy babies. The ratite industry is one that has grown phenomenally during the past few years. Research is being conducted daily to help all of us improve our incubation and hatching. By keeping up with current research, your next hatch can be an exciting and profitable experience that you look forward to each and every year.